Happening now, a Jamestown's man sentencing on federal charges of child pornography has been adjourned. What we know about the case, plus how the community celebrated Juneteenth over the past weekend. Well, it's another day, another chance for some severe thunderstorms later on in the afternoon. We will talk about it in detail next as the news at noon starts now. Live and on demand, this is WNY News Now. A Jamestown man sentencing on federal charges of child pornography has been adjourned. Thank you for joining us for WNY News Now. I'm Justin Gould. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Buffalo tells us that James Chapman will now be sentenced on July 14th after it was last scheduled for earlier this month. Chapman's sentencing has been adjourned for numerous reasons for nearly two years. He's pled guilty in May 2019 to charges of possession and production of child pornography. He faces a mandatory minimum penalty of 15 years behind bars, a maximum of 40, and a $250,000 fine. Prosecutors say that Chapman paid two victims $60 after having sexual intercourse with them back in November 2014. Following that, officials say Chapman took a cell phone picture of the two noon on his bed and distributed those photos to four people on Facebook. In 2017, officials add that Chapman requested and then received a sexually explicit image of a third victim and distributed that. In addition, they say he sent pictures of the first two victims to the third. The plea was a result of a joint investigation between the Jamestown Police Department and various federal authorities. Well, are loud cars and motorcycles keeping you up at night? Well, a new law here in New York is designed to turn down the volume. The Stop Loud and Excessive Exhaust Pollution Act, better known as the Sleep Act, passed both houses of the legislature. The act specifically bans selling or installing devices that increase the sound of a muffler on a motor vehicle or motorcycle. It would also increase fines for such modifications from $150 to $1,000 if signed by a car in, admitted car enthusiast, Governor Andrew Cuomo, who has not yet signaled whether he'll be signing the bill. Motorcyclists or drivers who are caught operating an altered vehicle could face up to a $500 fine. The bill also requires the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles to deny or revoke vehicle inspection licenses to businesses that violate muffler regulations more than twice or willfully within 18 months. Well, Jamestown's Juneteenth Festival took place over the weekend with two primary things on the agenda, honoring freedoms of the African-American community here locally and a late city councilwoman who dedicated her life to putting that festival on. WNY News Now's Julia Grass joining us live with more. Julia. That's right, Justin. Over the weekend, the city held its annual Juneteenth Festival, which also honored late city councilwoman Victoria James. Councilwoman Regina Brackman, among other speakers at the event, celebrated what she calls a victory after Juneteenth was declared a federal holiday. It's finally been recognized all the, or after all these years, you know, the sacrifices that have been made um, from the people that were freed from slavery and didn't know it. Could you imagine being freed and not know that you were freed? Alizé Scott, community educator at the YWCA in Jamestown, gave a brief history of the date and the meaning it holds. On that summer day in 1865, a, two, a full two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation and over two months after General Robert E. Lee surrendered, Major General Gordon Granger, um, commander of the U.S. Army's Department of Texas, delivered the news via, via General Order Number 3 to perhaps the very last enslaved people to learn that they were free. She further explained that the general order not only freed the slaves, but also gave them advice on how to proceed to freedom. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. She explains there were many reasons why the news that slaves were freed could have been delayed, including... There are some stories that they deliberately withheld this news in order to maintain the enslaved population on the plantations 
And then there's another version that states that they wanted to get another cropping season out before they delivered this news to the enslaved. Regardless, she says, this day in history was one full of disbelief and pure joy, with those celebratory emotions continuing to this day. Red-hued foods and drinks were often served, such as red velvet cake, red strawberry soda, and red punch always making an appearance with various stories of why this red color was important to the celebration. For a long time, relatives told the young ones that the red color symbolized the blood of the millions of enslaved people who had suffered and died. But the color red can also be traced back to our historical African roots as well. Juneteenth, Scott says, is also a reminder of the resiliency of the black community and counters the traditional point of view the history of slavery is often taught from. On Saturday morning, two trees were planted in Victoria James's memory at Jackson Taylor Park, who is credited with organizing the festival for the past 20 years. Additionally, a new scholarship in memory of James will include all the proceeds from the festival's concession stand. Justin, back to you. All right, Julia, absolutely incredible to see the community together. Thank you. Well, other news that happened over the weekend, 100 years of history was recognized during a community-wide photo recreation in Fluvanna. Take a look. The Fluvanna Community Historical Society invited members of the community to the town's old meeting house Saturday morning to recreate a photo taken 100 years ago. President of the group, Richard Kiefer, tells our crews he hopes recreating the symbolic photo will make an impact for future generations. Our vision is that this place becomes a center of community revitalization, that it becomes a place where we can connect with the past, connect with each other, and connect with that brighter future. We know that we're going to build a place where everybody belongs. To learn more about the Society's mission to preserve local history, you can check out their website. It's fluvannahistory.com. Well, we thank you for joining us for WNY News Now. Let us know uh, what you think about these stories and more in the comment section down below. We always love to hear from you. It's uh, great to see Don. Good to see Pam, Willie, Seth, and uh, Clyde as well. Hopefully you all are having a great Monday out there and uh, trying to stay cool because it is pretty humid. And I know with the humid, some showers could be on the way for later on. Let's get to Chief Forecaster Dakota Hunter, who's standing by in the First Defense Weather Center now with a look at that forecast. And uh, Dakota, uh, looking outside right now, you start to see the clouds building in. Yes, we do. In some spots we have clouds, in some spots we have some sunshine breaking out. And something we tell you all the time, sunshine is not a good thing. That fuels thunderstorm development. And even though with some of the clouds, it's still humid out there. 65 is the current dew point at Finley Lake. And uh, how about the rainfall yesterday? It came down in buckets where it rained. East Randolph over uh, almost one and a quarter inches in Sinclairville, over an inch, over an inch in Kennedy, also in Silver Creek here in town, and also almost an inch in Dunkirk. And we're going to have some more heavy downpours through the afternoon. This is the first batch of rain that moved through this morning. And uh, there was maybe a couple rumbles of thunder uh, kind of embedded within that. Now we've kind of cleared out now and you'll see the breaks of sunshine peeking out on the satellite imagery. That's what we're watching for the afternoon. So it's another day, another risk for severe thunderstorms. There is a slight risk, a level two out of five for basically all of Western New York and Northwestern Pennsylvania. This is for this afternoon. And we just got word from the uh, weather service in Buffalo via our real time chat, a severe thunderstorm watch will likely be issued for the western southern tier in northwestern Pennsylvania that will likely be issued within the next hour or two. And of course, everybody is here today. We'll keep you updated uh, throughout the day. So 80 is, uh, is where we topped out yesterday. 64 is where we started the day. 94 and 36 are the record highs and lows. So through the afternoon today, scattered showers and thunderstorms fire up basically early this mid-afternoon with some peaks of sunshine, hoping to fuel that. And some of those storms could be strong to severe, muggy and windy. 75 at the lakeshore, 82 inland and look at that wind out of the southwest at 10 to 30 miles per hour. Now we get some showers and storms tonight, then it turns much cooler for the middle of the week. We'll talk about it in detail with that seven-day forecast, plus the complete details on the severe threat as well in just a few. Justin. All right, Dakota, uh, folks, that's coming up in about 10 minutes' time, so thank you. Well, a top wide receiver with the Buffalo Bills is taking a stand against COVID-19 vaccinations. In a series of tweets, wide receiver Cole Beasley slammed the National Football League's Players Association 
for their decision to retain COVID protocols for those unvaccinated. The 32-year-old who finished the 2020 NFL season with 967 yards and four touchdowns states in what he calls a, quote, public service announcement, I may die of COVID, but I'd rather die actually living. Beasley claims that he is speaking out for himself and other players in the league who are not as outspoken and that, quote, if I'm forced to retire, so be it. Although there has been no comment from the NFL or the Bills organization, Erie County Executive Mark Polencar says the county is now rescinding the vaccine requirement to attend Bills games and other stadium events. Well, the 4th of July is less than two weeks away now. The day President Joe Biden's administration has been eyeing for months, shooting to get 70% of adults with at least one shot at the COVID-19 vaccine by then. Will we get there? At the rate we're going, experts say not likely. Britt Conway with more on what health experts are eyeing and concerned about as we get closer to the 4th of July. On July 4, we're going to celebrate our independence from the virus as we celebrate our independence of our nation. Independence from COVID-19, one shot at a time, by getting 70% of adults at least partially vaccinated in less than two weeks. We're at a little more than 65%, close, but at the weekly vaccination rate we're at, getting to 70 is unlikely. In 16 states and D.C., 70% of adults have gotten one dose. That's in dark green. In light green, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Wyoming are among the slowest to vaccinate. But medical experts are less worried about hitting 70% by the 4th. I think as a practical matter from a public health standpoint, it's not going to have an impact whether we hit 68% or 70%. And more worried about where we go from here. Now we need to think about trying to push out the vaccine into community sites where people could get it delivered to them through a trusted intermediary. That's going to mean doctors, offices, schools, places of employment. Especially as the Delta variant continues to spread. I anticipate that will be the predominant variant in the months ahead. It's already taking its toll in Missouri. We've seen a five-fold increase in uh, hospitalized patients in less than four weeks. Our doctors are describing them as uh, younger, sicker. They're often coming to us later in the disease process, so we have uh, less therapy options for them. I'm Britt Conway reporting. Britt, thank you. Coming up, a lot more to tell you about. A group dedicated to maintaining the waterways of Chautauqua Lake has gotten some new equipment to fight harmful algae blooms, the latest. And later, a potential deal might be in place for the county's infra for the co country's infrastructure. That and more as WNY News Now continues. Stay with us. Coverage that matters. This is WNY News Now. EagleZip.com is your local one-stop shop for all of your home and business computer needs. Located on Fluvan Avenue Extension, just outside of Jamestown, EagleZip.com sells and services all brands of desktops and laptops, as well as servers and network equipment for your business. All new computer sales include transferring your data from your old computer, plus a two-year warranty. Call EagleZip.com today. Stop by EagleZip.com today and let us make computers easy for you. Honest John says what you're looking for When you want it good, we're gonna give you lots more from freshly made subs to the best of pizza and wings, Honest John's has what you're looking for. And now two great locations, East 2nd Street and Fairmount Avenue. Order takeout or delivery today online at honestjohns.pizza. You're gonna get it good at Honest John's. Have the best summer ever with endless adventures at Girl Scout Summer Camp. Financial aid available, open to all girls. For more information, call or go to gswny.org. You're watching WNY News Now, where coverage comes first. A group dedicated to maintaining the waterways of Chautauqua Lake has received some new equipment to help fight harmful algae blooms. 
Funding for two new lake skimmers was previously made available through a 2018 state plan aimed at protecting fresh, waters, fresh bodies of water. The new watercraft will be used for lake weed harvesting and nearshore cleanup. While Chautauqua County is the official owner of that equipment, the Chautauqua Lake Association is leasing those skimmers and will pay for operating costs including staffing, fueling, and yearly maintenance of the craft. The group has already had similar skimmers, skimmers in use on the lake to fight the growing weed problem. While most algae is an important part of the lake ecosystem, harmful algae blooms produce toxins that can be harmful to people and animals. Cutting wake, lake weeds help reduce the number of blooms in a non-chemical way of combating the problem. Well, bargain hunters, today is your day. Amazon's 48-hour Prime Day is underway now. For the next two days, today and tomorrow, look for deals on things like fashion, toys, electronics, and so much more. You can join the fun. You need to have an Amazon Prime membership. If you don't have one, you could sign up for a 30-day free trial. This year's Prime Day is earlier than ever before. Amazon normally homes Prime Day later in the summer, but last year it was postponed until October in response to the pandemic. The company says last year's Prime Day was its best on record, by the way. Prime Day has taken place since 2015. Well, the Republican and Democrat toll chairs of the Problem Solvers Caucus say they're optimistic about coming together on a proposal for infrastructure. Their framework for a bill calls for adding more than $750 billion over an eight-year period. But even they admit not everyone in Congress will be on board. John Lawrence explains. There's been some progress on Capitol Hill regarding the Biden White House's infrastructure plan. Last week, I heard from a lot of my colleagues saying, I just need to look at one other issue. You know, can you do this? Can you do that? But uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in having a bipartisan proposal. 21 senators, 10 Democrats and 11 Republicans are inching closer to a bipartisan deal on parts of the proposal. If you want to work with Republicans to spend a trillion dollars uh, on infrastructure, it's available to you. If you don't want to go that route and you pick a $6 trillion reconciliation package, I think you'll get a lot of pushback from every Republican. Speaking of pushback, Senator Bernie Sanders is calling for a larger price tag for the bill to cover issues like climate change. I sometimes think we get boggled down in numbers and that's important, but we got to look at what the needs are of the American people, what's going on right now. And as talks continue, the clock keeps ticking. When you come out of a pandemic, America suddenly understands we've got real fractures in many areas. That's how we got Social Security. That's how we got Medicare. Now is the time to act, and we need to do it this summer. I'm John Lawrence reporting. John, thank you. Some moderate Democrats, including West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, says they are leery about the cost of the plan, and some have hinted they will not support it. Well, Music on the Pier is returning to the city of Dunkirk this week. The summer concert series kicks off Thursday at 5.30. The first two performances on June 24th and July 1st, both at 5.30, will take place at Memorial Park, though, rather than on the actual pier. The reason is because local officials feel there'll be larger than usual crowds at the event because it was called off last year. Now, after the 4th of July festivities, musical routines will return to the pier starting on July 8th. So it'll be exciting to get back to some normalcy. Thanks for joining us for WNY News Now. Uh, let us know what you guys think about these stories and more in the comments down below. We want to hear from you. Uh, it's good to see Victoria. Good to see Diane, Sheila, Joseph, and uh, Sarah and Cindy as well. Hopefully you all are having a great day. We appreciate it. And one thing that we really do appreciate too is how many awesome viewer photos we get of the weather. Now we always ask you to do it safely, but as Dakota and I have talked about a lot on this broadcast is that you guys really are our eyes on the ground. And mm -hmm. yesterday was no exception to that, Dakota. Yeah, yesterday we had, again, showers and storms moving through the area. Some of them went severe uh, during the nighttime hours. This is a great view of South Dayton, of one of the severe storms that came through from Ruth. That is one of the best pictures I think I've seen in quite a while. That is fantastic. And here's another shot of lightning. 
And uh, that was amazing. This was on the First Defense Weather Facebook page. Thanks to Amanda for sending that in. You can see the lightning right in the background there. That's another great picture. And of course, if you have any pictures or videos of the weather, Hunters WX on Twitter, the First Defense Weather page on Facebook, and use that hashtag, MyLocalWX. But please do it safely. Right now, we're at 77 degrees at the Jamestown Airport. It's windy out there. Southwest wind to 21, wind gust to 28. But look at that dew point of 63. Makes it feel more like 79 degrees out there. And that humidity is going to be part of what's going to be fueling the thunderstorms this afternoon. Now, there's a new update to the uh, severe weather outlook from the SPC. It hasn't came through on the system yet, but there's now an enhanced risk, a level three out of five. That includes basically from Olean back up into central New York, up towards Rochester. So there's now an enhanced risk in this zone right in through here. But for the western southern tier in northwestern Pennsylvania, we're still under a slight risk, a level two out of five for uh, this afternoon. And that is, and that's because thunderstorms are going to be flaring this afternoon. You'll see on the satellite and radar composite, that's the rain that moved through, but you'll notice some development peaking back in Ohio. That's what we're watching for this afternoon. What we talk about, sunshine's not a good thing on a day like today because that fuels thunderstorm development. This is all out ahead of a cold front. The front's right there in Michigan. You can actually pick it out on the satellite imagery right there. That's the cold front. That's going to be moving through, and that is going to bring us much more refreshing air and less humid air as we go into tomorrow and uh, the middle of the week. Tropical storm Claudette has now moved uh, off the uh, coast here. It is now off the uh, North Carolina coast. This is going to be moving out into land, but this brought a lot of flooding issues down across the deep south over the weekend. But that's not where our severe weather is coming from. It's out ahead of that front. So the weather impacts today. It's mainly a strong wind threat, also some hail, some flooding as well. These storms could be having torrential downpours, and there is a small risk of an isolated tornado. And again, it's small small, but it's not zero. So what we say, expect the unexpected. Let's take you through future scan. Brand new run shows you the showers and thunderstorms popping up this afternoon. This is by about two o'clock. Now, again, don't take the timing to the bank. This may flare up before two o'clock, but notice the showers and thunderstorms flaring across the western southern tier. They move eastward throughout the afternoon, and then we'll finally start to clear out maybe a few more showers and storms this evening. That clears out tonight. Now, tomorrow, there will be a chance for rain, mainly down across Warren County, I think will be the best chance for a rain shower and further out to the east. So if you're in central or northern Chautauqua County, you should stay dry through the day tomorrow with partly to mostly sunny skies. Now, uh, looking at it for tonight, 47 to 54 after that cold front moves through, it becomes much less uh, humid and more cooler. Here comes the future right now. 62 tomorrow, more refreshing. 74 Wednesday, the sun is back in good supply. It turns more uh, milder and muggier Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We're bringing a chance for more rain showers for the weekend. We'll take a break. Be right back. With coverage that matters, this is WNY News Now. I don't think that many kids in my son's school even do it. He makes fun of his friend who vapes. He would never try it. She's in the soccer. She's, She's on the honor roll. She's just on the tape. No way. No way. No way. No way. My kid would never vape. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping. Maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. Testicular cancer is the leading form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35. One in 250 men will be diagnosed with testicular cancer. But 98% will survive if detected early. As a survivor, I believe early detection is the key. Learn how to do a testicular self-exam and other important facts about testicular cancer at oneball4tc.com. You're watching WNY News Now, your source for breaking news. Well, to preserve or not to preserve, that's the question, as discussed by the Jamestown Planning Committee last week. WNY News Now's Jason Rutman tuned in to the virtual meeting in this report. Those on the commission went back and forth for around an hour last week discussing how to preserve historical sites in Jamestown. Commission member and principal planner for the city, Ellen Shadell, pushed to create a new ordinance that would make people have to turn over their property 
if it was deemed to be historically valuable. She cited multiple examples of old Jamestown buildings and homes that had been torn down and replaced with parking lots in support of her argument. If there had been an LPO back in the day when they were, you know, raising Brooklyn Square, maybe there still would be a Roosevelt Theater and there wouldn't be a drugstore drive through there anymore. She also voiced her opinion that these renovations didn't help the quality of Jamestown. However, Commission member Mike Lauren took a different stance. In general, I would like to see the ordinance written as if it was purely voluntary. And I, and, and I think someone has, to, you know, in order to be part of the historical or have your house on the historical preservation or under that umbrella, that the property owner has to voluntarily do that. I'm okay with it not being an ordinance though. So. History teacher, commission member, and city councilman Thomas Nelson seemed to take up the role of intermediary in the conflict. I love the idea of preserving some of these, these buildings, which I would consider a treasure. But, you know, you're, you've got to balance, um, you know, the business needs for the, of the city with trying to preserve some of those treasures. According to federal historic tax credit data that was presented by Shadle, Preservation efforts in New York State created 8,600 jobs and generated $151 million in 2019. Shadle says an issue for the city is when a property owner buys a historic building and then lets the structure fall into disrepair. Over time, she says that becomes unusable and feels there must be a regulation to help prevent the scenario. She suggested a $1,000 fine and a year in jail for people who don't follow historical preservation landmark zoning laws something that other board members seem to disagree with. I bet those punishments exist for other zoning laws, but I don't know of anyone that's ever been, you know, prosecuted for that. In the end, the group decided to create some sort of regulatory commission and form a rule set to help preserve the area's history. Jason Rutman, WNY News Now. All right, Jason, thank you. Interesting points that they made there. Let us know what you guys think about in the comments down below. Uh, would somebody be prosecuted if they uh, didn't take care of their property and it was deemed a historical structure? That's quite the argument. And uh, as, as uh, he mentioned in his report, they really didn't come to any sort of a conclusion about that. To be continued, I guess, we'll certainly uh, let everybody know. Well, Dakota, I see the flashing uh, lightning in the graphic behind you. This is no, 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 not, not, not live, just a graphic. Um, however, I know that uh, it's going to be another stormy, stormy day, and even tonight, maybe. Yep, you know, it's another day, another severe weather threat. So again, just to uh, walk you through the main impacts, it's mainly going to be a strong damaging wind threat, along with some isolated large hail. Flooding, definitely possible. These storms could be laying down some torrential rainfall. There is a small tornado threat. It's not zero, but it's not big either. It's a small threat. And also noteworthy, severe thunderstorm watch just came out within the last, I think, 60 seconds. It was just issued. That is for all of Western New York and Northwestern Pennsylvania. That watch uh, uh, that watch goes until eight o'clock tonight. So severe thunderstorm watch now in place for the entire region until eight o'clock tonight. Andrew Stevenson and the whole weather staff is here. We're gonna have a busy afternoon along with us. But hey, we've got the munchies in the weather office. We've got all our snacks. We're good. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the watch, I think, important mm -hmm. to, to kind of cue people on not saying that there's actually an active severe thunderstorm right. at the moment however it's more than likely going to happen right afternoon. so basically a watch means that conditions do warrant the chance for severe thunderstorms and you know the confidence on this is pretty high we're already seeing storm development down across uh, ohio coming up into northwestern pennsylvania so again as the storms move into the more unstable air that we have across the area yeah we could see some of them strong to severe so make sure you have a way of getting those watches and warnings this afternoon and should need be Weather coverage warrants will be here and we'll go on the air with wall-to-wall -wall coverage should we need to. Yeah, absolutely. And you provide great updates too here on Facebook as well. So stay tuned for that possibly, folks. Thank you, Dakota. We'll see you back here tomorrow at noon, if not before. That's going to do it for us today. We'll leave you with this live look over downtown Jamestown. Uh, today might not be a great day for an umbrella if you get some of those gusty winds. So uh, as he mentioned, uh, try to stay up to date by downloading the WNY News Now mobile app. Um, you can also uh, 
follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WNY News Now. And of course, news continues 24 7 on our website, WNY News Now. We're back here tomorrow at noon. Hope to see you then.